Blaise Pascal was a brilliant philosopher, mathematician, and scientist more generally, who lived during the 17th century. He was a Frenchman. He lived much of his life uh, in Paris, and he was a polymath and really an extraordinary prodigy. His dates were 1623 to 1662. He investigated numerous mathematical properties, especially of conic sections. He worked in uh, early physics. He was influential in the development of probability theory, especially, and he also engaged in numerous theological disputes that were internal to the Roman Catholic Church. He subscribed to the Jansenist views, the Dan Jansenist wing of the French Catholic Church, and his uh, intellectual enemies at the time were the Jesuits. Blaise Pascal, uh, his pensées is um, literally just thoughts, and unfortunately it's not a completed work. It's a series of fragments that he intended to collect and publish in a more completed systematic fashion. Unfortunately, he died as a relatively young man at the age of uh, 39, and so he could not live to complete the pensées. Blaise Pascal was a very pessimistic thinker, and so illustrative of this is, for instance, this concise statement of the human condition that he makes uh, in the work. Imagine a number of men in chains, all under sentence of death, some of whom are each day butchered in the sight of the others. Those remaining see their own condition in that of their fellows, and looking at each other with grief and despair await their turn. This is an image of the human condition. This is a very pessimistic view of life, but it captures the reality that all of us are going to die. And for Pascal, the fact of our death is the most important thing, perhaps, that we have to grapple with in life. And it's something that he himself believed uh, he had a very uh, successful or constructive way of approaching. Pascal was also uh, pessimistic about the use of our reason. So if Thomas Aquinas is a Christian who's the great proponent of reason or rational based approaches to understanding the world, because in Aquinas's view, God gave us reason by which to understand the world. For Pascal, in fact, our reason is deeply flawed, uh, not only because of sin, but just because as a faculty, it's not capable of the kinds of things that we might want to ascribe to it. Uh, the reality is that um, many persons, uh, in order to get through life, they divert themselves from trying to investigate the difficult topics like the fact of their death. But when they attempt to use their reason, he thinks that their prospects are modest because the limitations of reason are so substantial. Especially um, limited is our ability to reason about matters of ultimate importance. Here's a quote, there is no certainty apart from faith as to whether man was created by a good God, an evil demon, or just by chance, and so it is a matter of doubt, depending on our origin, whether these innate principles are true, false, or uncertain. To press reason and to attempt to use reason in substantive ways beyond its capacities leads us to become either skeptics or it leads us to become uh, dogmatists. For Pascal, the limitations of our reason are especially compounded by the fact of God's hiddenness. God has deliberately hidden himself from us. So some quotes from the Pensees underscore this. That God wished to hide himself. If there were only one religion, God would be clearly manifest. If there were no martyrs except in our religion. Likewise, God being thus hidden, any religion that does not say that God is hidden is not true, and any religion which does not explain why does not instruct. Ours does all this, verily thou art a God that hidest thyself. God uh, hides himself from those who seek him, but the question is why? And for Pascal, God wishes to move the will rather than the mind. Perfect clarity would help the mind and harm the will. Therefore, God seeks to humble the pride of men. Knowing God without knowing our own wretchedness makes for pride. Knowing our own wretchedness without knowing God makes for despair. Knowing Jesus Christ strikes the balance because he shows us both God and our own wretchedness. So God's reasons for hiding himself included 
the desire to uh, give us the ability to seek him, but without pride. Very famously, Pascal offered an argument for God's existence that's not really an argument, it's more like a, a gambling wager. The reality is that we're all going to die. And in light of this, Pascal says that the most important question that we need to ask is, does God exist? Either God does or God does not exist. So there are two potential outcomes, two potential solutions that we can find out when we die and wake up on the other side. If we die and wake up on the other side and God does exist, and of course we'll find out the solution. If we find, die and wake up on the other side, there's no God. Uh, well, we probably just won't wake up on the other side. It'll probably just be that our, um, our lives will dissipate into nothingness. There are two potential uh, stances that we could take towards the question, does God exist? We can take the stance, yes, God does exist, or take the stance, no, God does not exist. To say maybe, to take the agnostic stance, in other words, is at the end of one's life uh, to say no. The agnostic stance becomes a no upon one's death. And by a, a yes stance, Pascal just means that one must uh, live uh, the truth that one intellectually affirms. One must uh, go to Mass, say one's prayers, give charitably, do good deeds, and so forth in order to confirm one's uh, one's wager of a yes uh, that yes that God exists we all have to make this wager it's not possible for us not to wager not wagering is not an option for by being born we are already committed to making a decision one way or the other for Pascal we need to think about the possible payoffs to the uh, wager so one can imagine that if um, one thinks of the expected values here, expected values are equal to the probability times the payoff minus the cost. Um, the expected value provides an abstract guide then to the most rational bet uh, in response to the question, does God exist? So if you think about it, if you bet yes, God does exist, and you wake up on the other side and yes, he does exist, you were right, uh, you gain an, an eternity of infinite happiness and flourishing. So an infinite number of uh, pleasures. If you bet yes, God does exist and you wake up on the other side or, or you don't wake up on the other side, uh, whatever, the reality is he doesn't exist, then uh, you lose out on a certain number of finite pleasures that you could perhaps have enjoyed in this life. Uh, for Pascal, every sin is sweet for a season, and there are a certain number of finite pleasures that one can have in this life if one chooses not to believe in God. Maybe the pleasure of, of making money at the expense of impoverished persons who you exploit, or, or maybe the pleasure of being able to, to cheat on your taxes, or or uh, say to sexually to sleep around with uh, with multiple partners or, or, or uh, maybe to violate various other Christian moral uh, injunctions in ways that are pleasurable. Many philosophers have argued that virtue is its own reward and so they have believed that living a virtuous life is something that's valuable in itself. Most famously Aristotle of course argued this. For Pascal uh, that certainly may be the case, but the fact is also that there are certain pleasures that can result from living a sinful life. Um, if the bet that you make is no, God does not exist, and you wake up on the other side and God does not exist, or maybe you just don't wake up at all, then you have made a correct bet. You have successfully enjoyed finite pleasures in this life. You've successfully pursued uh, finite enjoyments. But you also uh, risk an infinite downside. If you make the bet no and you wake up on the other side and God does exist, then you're hosed. Uh, you have chosen to live your life without believing in God. And for Pascal, remember, this isn't just an intellectual exercise. It's a matter of practice as well. And so if you wake up on the other side and God does exist, then you're risking an infinite downside 
uh, in the face of, of God's judgment. When we focus on the cost benefit analysis with respect to placing the bet, we have to discount the consequences of losing a bet. So betting yes, God does exist, offers an infinite payoff at finite cost. Whereas betting no, that God does not exist, atheism, you're uh, offering yourself or you're opening yourself up to exposing yourself to a finite payoff at potentially infinite uh, expense if your bet is incorrect. In terms of a rational betting strategy, the better bet seems to be betting that God does exist. And for Pascal, this means betting that, uh, that the Christian God is who he says he is uh, and is as the tradition says he is and, and the scriptures. So there are some critiques that have been leveled against Pascal's wager over the years. So one criticism is that Pascal's wager does not serve as a proof of the correctness of the uh, or the, the truth of the Christian God. So this critique is that uh, the wager could be run for any religion that teaches the existence of God in an afterlife, for Islam or perhaps for some variant of Hinduism. And this critique seems to be generally correct. The Pascal wager does not seem to be a successful demonstration of the correctness of the Christian religion over and against other religions. It does, however, seem to be a pretty decisive reason or to offer a pretty decisive reason not to be an atheist. And that reason is that uh, being an atheist risks an infinite downside, whereas you can only gain a merely finite upside. And that seems to be a dangerous way to live one's life, at least for Pascal. A couple of other criticisms of uh, Pascal's wager have been raised. So the wager is uh, a dependent proof for God's existence. So it's dependent upon other arguments. The wager doesn't work if the probability of God's existence is zero. The probability of God's existence must be greater than zero in order for the potential payoff to be infinite. So it requires other proofs such as the cosmological or teleological proofs to be correct in order for the wager to work because it requires other proofs in order for the existence of God to be greater than zero or the probability of that existence. Uh, another criticism of the wager is that it's cynical and that it develops wrongful motives in us. It seems to suggest that the core reason why we ought to believe in God is uh, selfish, namely what can we obtain or get from the arrangement. And this seems to be something that uh, Pascal was aware of and it seems to be something that he uh, believed we would uh, pass beyond uh, once we entered into the uh, Christian life. So the wager for Pascal appears merely to have been a starting point, uh, a way of reasoning, especially with persons inclined to atheism. But then once we pass beyond that starting point, he seems to have thought that persons would see the value of the Christian life in and of itself. It's a life that is valuable and one that you should live for God's sake out of uh, obedience to God, a desire to obey God, uh, and, and not just for selfish gain. But once you enter into the Christian life, you can begin to see the value of it, at least in Pascal's view. And this would overcome any naturally cynical motives that you might have to take the wager just for uh, mercenary purposes.